Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Eminent Interdisciplinary Program in Environmental Resources, we finally call it EIPER. Um, my name is Charlie Colstead. I'm a professor and senior fellow here at Stanford, and um, I'm delighted to chair this particular session. In fact, today I have the pleasure to serve as the University Oral Examination Chair for Garrett Alvistegui Adler uh, dissertation defense. It's entitled Social Order and Social Protection Mechanisms and Moderators in Climate Related Violent Conflict. After the successful completion of the oral exam, um, we hope to formally award Garrett a doctoral degree in environment and resources. As part of Garrett's examination committee, I'm joined by his lead advisors, Marshall Burke, Associate Professor of Earth System Science and Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, the Woods Institute for the Environment, and at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. And Anne has a co-advisor, Ken Schultz, a professor of political science. As well as the other members of his dissertation reading committee, Jeremy Weinstein, professor of political science and senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, which I am also affiliated with and Catherine Mock, who uh, was at Stanford for a number of years, but is now a professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the Rosenthal, Rosenthal uh, Rosenthal, excuse me, School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami, very far from me. Uh, we'll start with a public lecture. After Garrett has finished his presentation, members of the audience will get a chance to ask questions. I will moderate this process and repeat it again later, but as a heads up, members of the audience attending virtually may ask their questions by typing them in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll read your questions out loud to the audience. And if you're there in person, um, raise your hands. And once I call on you, please direct your questions directly to Garrett, standard way of asking a question. Uh, with that said, I will now pass the uh, baton over to Marshall Burke. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my pleasure today as one of Garrett's co-advisors to uh, introduce him briefly. Uh, his other co-advisor, uh, Ken Schultz, will be regaling us with stories uh, after the uh, hopeful successful completion of, of the defense. Um, so I've known Garrett basically since he arrived at Stanford, again, having served as one of his co-advisors. Uh, but I'd have to say one of my first uh, strongest memories of Garrett when he early on in his career was uh, TAing uh, for an undergrad, a large undergrad uh, introduction to climate change class uh, that I co-taught with a, a few other uh, instructors. Uh, and if you don't know, Garrett actually, before uh, coming to Stanford, had a background as a public school teacher uh, in the public schools in New York City. Um, so if you've been to a large Stanford undergraduate class, this is a class we're trying to get kids excited about climate change. Um, I'm dressed like a schlubby professor. Uh, and uh, Garrett knew a lot about climate uh, and its impacts on society. And so we let him do one of the main uh, lectures. And he actually gave a guest lecture, I think, on climate and conflict, if, if I uh, remember. Um, and so Garrett comes in. Uh, unlike us, he's dressed. He's wearing a tie. So he looks sort of like he does today, plus a tie. Uh, and he's printed out the names of every single student in the class. Uh, and he proceeds to cold call <laughs> the students with specific questions about the reading uh, throughout the class, which is something we had never done, right? We were being so soft on the undergrads. And here comes Garrett, uh, really hardcore with his uh, training as a public school teacher uh, in the Bronx. So early on, I, I realized this guy was, uh, was pretty hardcore. Uh, that continued. Uh, so uh, Garrett and I, in some sense, followed similar paths in graduate school. We both decided to uh, have children and start a family while in graduate school and while living in tiny apartments in very expensive coastal cities. Uh, zero out of 10 would not recommend. Um, and uh, Garrett managed to do this uh, during COVID, no less. Uh, and 
was able to complete a, what you'll see is a very impressive dissertation uh, throughout that. So I've been really impressed um, with Garrett's uh, progress and his determination to make, uh, you know, make new research insights and progress on a range of really important uh, societal and environmental uh, challenges, as he'll tell you about today. So Garrett, proud of all the work you've done and uh, excited to see your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charlie and Marshall, uh, for that. Marshall, for the wonderful introduction. I'm like glowing over here. Hopefully I can sort of keep it together and, and get through this talk. Um, so I am here uh, to talk to you about, sorry, okay. My name is Garrett Alvistegui Adler. I'm a PhD candidate in the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. And I'm here to talk to you about my dissertation, which focuses on social order and social protection, mechanisms and moderators in climate related violent conflict. I'm going to set a timer for myself. So I do not go way over time. All right, so the climate is warming. It's happening everywhere. This map on the, these maps on the top show that sort of basically crossed almost the entire earth. There's a, a, a warming direction to temperature. We have a lot of confidence in that shift. And it's quite consistent as compared with other um, factors like precipitation, uh, which has a lot of variability in terms of the direction of the change. But overall, we know the earth is, is moving in, in new and more variable directions in terms of the climate system. There's evidence from Marshall and others to suggest that this higher level of temperature and these more extreme conditions in rainfall are likely to cause an increase in violent human conflict. So we expect people to fight each other and potentially even kill each other more when the temperature increases or when uh, the rainfall is more erratic. And this is a very scary and, and uh, a worrying development that we may expect to see as, as um, climate change proceeds. So my research and focus is guided by some fundamental questions. How do humans respond socially and politically when faced with challenges of uh, uh, sort of challenging climatic conditions? For example, are they more likely to cooperate and act peacefully, coming together to deal with challenging uh, circumstances? Or are they more likely to engage in conflict and fight over scarce resources or for other reasons? And why, what are the mechanisms driving these, uh, these changes? So during the talk today, I'm gonna to try to cover a few different questions. I'm going to think about why might climate stress lead to conflict. We're going to consider why might social factors or policies matter to the degree to which climate change or variability causes conflict. We're going to uh, think a little bit about how social scientists of, of my variety gather data to answer these questions. What have we learned from the analysis that I've done at this point? Why does it matter for communities and policymakers uh, that these results uh, have, have occurred? Um, and what do I or what should we still want to learn as we move forward in developing our understanding of these relationships? So the puzzle that I'm trying to get at is motivated in part by this figure. What this is showing is that uh, in different parts of the continent of Africa, and I should say that, that all the chapters in my dissertation use data from various parts of Africa, um, what is the relationship between temperature and conflict, between the mean annual temperature in a given place and year and the level of, or the number of conflict events, battles, uh, massacres, uh, riots in those places. And what you're seeing here is a, a sort of a wide degree of variation. So places that are red, and especially places that are surrounded by a little box, uh, show a positive, and if they're boxed, significant relationship between temperature and conflict. And higher temperature in that place is correlated, this is not a causal relationship, but it's correlated with more conflict. Cooler temperatures are correlated with more conflict in places that are blue. So we see there's actually quite a bit of variation across the continent in terms of just, again, the raw correlations between the temperature and the conflict. And this creates a, a puzzle that we wanna to try to understand. Why are these places different? What are some social or political factors that could be operating on the ground that could moderate or change the degree to which uh, higher temperatures cause more conflict? Uh, if these are causal, so higher temperatures are associated with more conflict in this case. So I'm gonna use this schematic, schematic a bunch through my talk to think about two different types of broad questions I have. One is about moderators and one is about uh, mechanisms or causal causal mechanisms. So the idea of a moderator is the fact that when, if we think there's some relationship between some climatic stressor like high temperature or drought and the level of conflict, there are some social factors or policies or political factors that might be in place to moderate or change the degree to which this causes conflict. So it might matter, for example, whether you're a democracy or an autocracy. Uh, maybe democracies handle uh, climate stress better than autocracies do, or maybe the reverse is true. Uh, maybe if you have more social trust, which is the topic of one of my chapters in my dissertation, that'll increase or decrease the degree to which uh, a conflict happens when there's, say, a drought. And the other sort of schema is a notion of causal mechanisms. This is a very simple diagram. Normally, these are much more complex. This is like really, really simplified. But the idea is that there may be certain 
causes, there may be a drought, and that drought may lead to some other outcome, say people can't grow crops well enough, and that may lead to some other outcome, like they're desperate and they need to go and find another source of income, so they go and join a criminal organization, and that might lead to another outcome, like a higher level of violence due to the, an increase in recruitment by the criminal organization. So this is a, what I consider a mechanism, so a sort of causal chain from point A to point B that shows the flow of, I guess, causality from uh, some sort of climatic stressor to a change in the level of conflict. And my, disser, uh, my different parts of my dissertation will we'll use, will focus on uh, different ones of these moderators or mechanisms or both. And this little let, slash is to indicate that one of the things we wanna do as, as people who are worried about this is to, create a, is to try to break these causal chains. So to sort of put something that blocks the pathway, say from a drought to people losing their income or from lost income to recruitment into a violent group. And that will reduce the degree to which these stressors lead to conflict. There's a bunch of existing research uh, from a variety of other, of other folks to, to study different moderators or different factors that can make a difference in terms of the degree to which high temperature or drought or other factors cause conflict. It might, depend if you de uh, it might depend on whether you depend on the rain to grow your crops or to feed your animals. It might depend on the structure of your sort of social relationships. Are you close with your cousins and brothers or are you sort of more close with just the people who live near you? And how does that affect your degree to which you can rally people together to go and fight? Um, it might matter whether there's a major government program, a social safety net program to provide you with benefits even when there's a drought. Um, and it might matter uh, how sort of human beings actually respond to temperature spikes, increases in temperature, in terms of their emotional state and their decision-making processes. So these are a number of topics that have been studied thus far in the literature on climate variability and conflict. And, um, sorry, we already saw the scheme. Okay, uh, so this is just reviewing some of the questions we're gonna try to answer today. And the first one I'm gonna try to tackle is, uh, why might climate stress lead to conflict? So I'm gonna paint for you a, a few different pictures or sort of um, understanding concepts that help us to understand um, why this would be the case. So one is this notion of opportunity cost. I actually already spoke about this. This is the idea that if we have a choice between growing crops, let's say, and fighting in a rebel group or a criminal organization, that's like an alternative source of income. If the crops aren't growing well, then we have to find some other source of income. And this other group may provide us with an opportunity to go and engage in a risky and violent sort of activity. But when we're desperate, we might choose that option. So we expect that the worse the climate conditions are for economic productivity and, and uh, income generation and the ability to feed ourselves and our families, the more likely it is we may engage in alternate sources of income generation or alternate um, ways to, to get by. And those might be violent and dangerous. And that could increase the degree to which conflict is is happening and so climate impacts, climate stressors can cause more conflict through that pathway. Another is, is about upsetting balances in terms of, um, you might call it some threat capabilities or the balance of power between two groups. So you could imagine a case where there's a bunch of, um, there's a potential rebel group, there's a rebel group that exists in a kind of ethnic enclave of certain countries. So there's people who wanna uh, get more benefits from the central government, they're not being well treated and that sort of thing. And they negotiate with the government about what benefits they might get. Maybe they get access to extra seats in the parliament, or maybe, that's not fair. Maybe they get extra, extra seats in the cabinet, let's say. Or maybe they get an opportunity to teach their kids, uh, to educate their kids in their own local language, as opposed to being forced to, to follow some sort of centralized government language or something like that. These groups and the government can negotiate over their needs and desires. But often these negotiations rely on some consistency in the, in the level of um, expected fighting ability. And climate disruptions and shocks can, can, can disrupt that expected level of fighting capacity and can lead to sort of upsetting these balances and making it harder to, to get access to the resources you want. And so groups may see an opportunity to go and take advantage of these upset balances. Like let's say, for example, um, crops aren't growing really well and the government needs those crops to feed <coughs> folks in the city. So they're scared and they're more nervous and they need to sort of tap into other resources. Well, that makes the government vulnerable and it may give an opportunity for other groups to come in and try to attack and, and take advantage of that. So that can lead to conflict when there's this upset balance of power. One more, I'm gonna skip over this one. One more option for, for climate causing conflict is a more direct or psychological mechanism. And that involves people's emotional state and sort of psych, um, uh, physiological conditions when there is higher temperature. So there's some evidence that there is a higher level of aggression by human beings when the temperature is hot. This comes from everything from people honking horns to throwing baseballs at batters to tackling harder in football, as well as to actual homicides and engagement in violent conflict in Iraq and places like that. And so as the temperature increases, the likelihood that any individual might engage in sort of risky violent behavior may increase. 
And also, if that is the case, it could lead to a greater propensity for, for violence escalation. So let's say there's just a little bit more violence, but people aren't thinking rationally, and they, they misunderstand it as being a more dangerous thing, or people are uh, just sort of seeing more conflict events than they might otherwise, this may lead to a sort of spiraling effect that can, that can cause problems. So all these reasons are, are a few of the many possible mechanisms linking uh, climate factors that we expect to increase under climate change to these violent outcomes. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking to you about my first study in my dissertation. There are three. I will mainly focus this talk on the first one, um, but I'll briefly touch on the other two uh, later in the discussion. This study, what is it doing? Well, it's focusing on a moderator. In particular, it's asking about how high temperatures are moderated by this idea of social capital, which I'll define in a moment. So I'm gonna claim that when there's higher or low, lower social capital, it makes a difference to the degree to which high temperatures cause conflict. So what is social capital? There are a variety of types of capital that social scientists talk about. There's human capital, like education and skills, there's physical capital, uh, like machinery and tools, there's financial capital, but social capital is about the benefits that you gain from being in networks or having membership in groups with other people. And actually, if you've been paying attention to the New York Times and the recent research out of Raj Chetty's group, on social mobility, their latest paper is about how the social capital connections with other people across um, income levels affect social mobility. So that would have another place where this, this topic is discussed. Okay, there are different types of social capital that I consider in my study. One is about bonding. So that's how much do you trust people in a similar social strata to you? Do you trust your neighbors? Do you trust your relatives or other people that you know? Another one is bridging which is also horizontal. So you're not talking about like leaders and followers, you're talking about people on a sort of similar level, but it's a further apart kind of connection. So now we're connecting people sort of who are more distant from us in the sort of social structure. And I measure this using questions from a survey about membership in community organizations, attendance at community meetings, and whether you join others to raise an issue. And finally, uh, there's a third dimension, which is a vertical dimension. And that's actually about how much you are in contact with and how much you trust your local leaders or traditional leaders. So if I'm sort of a regular person and I have a local leader, and I say, I trust that leader, then I, then I measure social capital to be, to be higher in that case. And I should sort of backtrack real quick and to say that all of these uh, bullet points are referencing specific questions that I look at on a survey to determine how high or low the level of social capital is in a certain place. And I'll talk more about that data collection process in a sec. Okay, next question we're trying to answer today, why might social factors or policies matter? Um, so in the case of social capital, I propose three different uh, ways in which social capital makes a difference for, um, for uh, climate change and conflict. And these include resilience, violence suppression, and violence enhancement. So first we'll talk about resilience. The idea of resilience is somewhat straightforward and it is that basically if social capital provides us with benefits that allow us to recover more effectively from climatic stressors. So let's say there's a big drought that I can call on my uh, relatives and and friends who live in the city to provide me with money through remittances and I don't suffer as much through the drought. Or maybe I can work together with my neighbors to, um, to recruit, uh, to, sort of to, to, to build political power, to, uh, to uh, gain support from a central government or from an international actor to provide us with new wells or provision of food aid or something like that. So, so um, in these various ways, uh, social capital can enhance the resilience of a local community and if people are more resilient, they're less likely in general to face difficulty from the climate system. And so any negative outcomes, conflict, food insecurity, malnutrition, um, other things like that are less likely to be a problem if the place where you live has a higher level of this social capital related resilience. Next, I have a notion of violence suppression. And the idea of violence suppression is, is, a, is a different one. And it's that there are sort of um, various institutions or people or social structures that can be in place in a community that can lead to um, differences in the way to, in the degree to which uh, any violence that is occurring can be suppressed or can be addressed um, effectively. And so, for example, if there's a, a kind of a, a leader at a sort of higher, so let's say you have a leader of your community and a leader of a neighboring community, but there's sort of a, a political structure that, that leads to a sort of a higher level of uh, adjudicator some sort of like regional leader who can adjudicate between disputes between the two local communities. And there's a lot of trust. There's a lot of social capital as I'm sort of thinking about. There's a lot of trust between the people in each of these communities and this leader. So if one of them goes and has like a minor conflict with the other one, if one steals something from the other one or there's a, a trampling of crops by somebody's cattle and you can appeal to a very well trusted local a higher level leader, then they can suppress the potential for that small level conflict to spiral into higher levels of violence. 
Another way in which trust and social capital matter for violent suppression is that you can just have more connections, more social connections between groups that might otherwise be fighting. So groups that have competition over a common resource, let's say, if they're well connected and they have lots of people who know each other, they can probably find more ways to tamp down those sorts of disputes and keep them from getting violent or keep them from exploding and getting worse. So I think social capital can create this sense of violent suppression. This leads to the first hypothesis from my first paper, which is that in places where social capital is greater, the marginal effect of temperature on conflict will be lower. Marginal effect is a bit of a fancy term, um, but it basically what it means is temperature will cause less conflict if there's more social capital. And that is based on this idea that resilience and violent suppression are important factors in the degree to which social cap, sorry, in the degree to which temperature causes conflict. So there's another direction though that these, these, uh, this route might take, which is that social capital could actually be bad, could actually enhance the degree to which violence occurs under climatic stress. And what would that look like? Well, the, no, the main notion here has to do with um, kind of a uh, kind of social scientist's way of thinking about how and when conflicts happen, which is that if you're annoyed, if you have a grievance, if you're frustrated with the government or you're frustrated with the community across the river, something like that, you don't necessarily go pick up and fight them right away. You might just whine about it. You might just talk to your friend and try to find some other solution to the problem. Um, you might not have the sort of wherewithal to, to gather up resources to go and fight. You need to come together with other people to engage in an intergroup conflict, right? If it's not gonna just be some sort of one-on-one -on -one homicide, if it's gonna be group versus group, like a rebel group versus a government, you need to actually rally people together to, to enact that kind of fighting. And so that means you have to overcome what's referred to as a social dilemma or sort of collective action dilemma. And uh, factors in society that make those dilemmas easier to overcome can lead to more conflict or can make it easier for a, some sort of trigger to lead to conflict. And so if there's high social capital, it may actually have this avert, adverse effect where some sort of climatic trigger or some sort of climatic problem can actually lead to a greater likelihood of conflict when there's more social capital because it's so easy to rally with your friends and neighbors and relatives to go and fight. So this leads to an alternative hypothesis, which is the opposite direction, which is that in places where social capital is greater, the marginal effect of temperature on conflict will be higher. In other words, in places where social capital is greater, the degree to which temperature is gonna cause conflict will be even worse. So we would see that actually high social capital makes it even more dangerous when the temperature is high, if this hypothesis is supported. We'll note that these are directly opposed So in the actual empirical analysis in my paper. If I see support for one, it doesn't mean the other one isn't true. It just means it's sort of dominating. It's more, it's operating at a stronger level. So you could have, um, if you see a, an, a, an effect that's supporting hypothesis one, it could mean just that like the resilience and violence suppression mechanisms are, or sort of features are much stronger than the violence enhancement. Violence enhancement could be there, but it's just not as, as powerful as the other ones. And then finally, I have another hypothesis about the, the types of social capital, which proposes that the linking social capital this vertical dimension about how much you trust your, rel your sorry, your, your, not your relatives, your, your leaders can matter more because that is supporting the adjudication, um, violence suppression uh, factor in social capital and it can make it easier for you to gain access to external resources. So you can rally all you want with your friends and neighbors to like build a new well, but if you lack any sort of tools or you lack any sort of equipment that may be very difficult to do. You may need access to outside help and the best way to get outside help is through sort of connections to local leaders and higher level leaders. And so that I think is maybe the most important of the various social fa capital factors. Okay, next question we wanna to answer today is how do we actually gather data to answer these questions? So I'm gonna show you, this is actually a little bit of a data set, a little clip of my data set from my third chapter, but the structure of the data is very similar, uh, at least in my first and second chapter. And I just wanna give you a sense for those of you who are not engaged in this work directly, like what are we actually doing here? So basically what we're trying to do is create rows of information where for any given place and year, this is, a, this is a district in Ethiopia, Desi Zuria. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And in 2004, and in Desi Zuria in 2004, we need to know a bunch of information about that place. How many conflict events were there? Were there protests, were there riots, were there battles? What is the temperature and what is the precipitation level in that place? Uh, in the case of this third chapter, we're gonna be talking about um, a social safety net program. So like how much do people benefit from this safety net program? In the case of my first chapter, this is social capital. So how much social capital is there? Is there a lot, is there a little? That's gonna be a factor here. And we might have some other pieces of information like the population or other factors. And the main thing we wanna do is we, we need to gather this information as much as possible for every place and every year in our data set to run our analysis. So where do we actually get this info from? One place is we get climate info from these data from climate uh, sort of reanalyzed off in climate models or the products of climate uh, analyses that are distributed across the whole globe in these little tiny boxes called rasters. 
or the sort of the map in general is called a raster. And it's made of these tiny boxes of information that tell us how much precipitation there is in these little places. And then what we do is we take a map and we lay that map over the top of this information in this raster. And we're going to then grab the information in a geographic information systems context, um, which I do in, in the R programming language, if you're familiar already with that. And we're going to sort of learn about, okay, how, how does the precipitation differ from this place versus this place in this given year? And then we're gonna take, we're gonna start with like really specific small scale information in these tiny little boxes. And we're gonna average it out for each uh, area on the map to get us an overall amount of precipitation in that area for that month or that year. So this turns into this map, which is an average of each of those levels of precipitation by year in 1985 is just an example. So we go from this to this, and then we go from this to our data set. And that's how we get these actual numbers of precipitation by year or potentially by month in each of these little places. So again, these boxes here, oops, this one is gonna be really high. So if I was gonna get a number for this location, it's probably a very high number of precipitation, whereas these are much lower and these are gonna be much lower numbers. And then those get put on our data set for our analysis. And then the other, then I go to other data sources like conflict data and I have conflict data from different individual locations. Where was there a battle? Where was there a riot? And then I add them all up in each place. So for each district, which is called the Woreda in Ethiopia, I sum up the total number of conflict events, which are indicated with the red dots, and even in each district and year. And that generates a map that looks like this. And so this tells me, okay, in total, uh, this is actually over the entire data period. So it's not just one year, it's all years. How many conflict events are there in each of these places um, in time? And so that, again, it gets added into our data set as another place in another column for each row of the data set. And finally, in, the, in this first chapter, my main moderator of interest is social capital. And I measure social capital in three ways, as I discussed. And for each of those ways, I create an index. So I create a, um, a aggregation, a, 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 an average of all the people in each little grid cell across the map of Africa. So in each grid cell, which is about 55 kilometers long in sort of real, real life terms, anyone who lives within the grid cell, I look at their answers to a survey question. I combine them or I average them out with all the other people who live in the grid cell. And then I average them across the different questions that form my index. So for bonding, that's questions about trust and relatives, trust in neighbors and trust in people you know. And I come up with an overall value and that's my index value. And then I kind of standardize it. So it ranges from negative five to positive three in this case. And I have that for each of the different categories. And this shows the, the correlation between these different types of social capital. And then I do the same thing at a broad scale for all social capital, overall social capital using something called the principal components analysis. I'm gonna talk more about that in Q and A, but basically gives us an overall picture of where is social capital high and where is it low. And that where is social capital high and where is it low is gonna be the main factor I wanna ask a question about uh, in my study. So this is the like super technical page. I'm just gonna sort of give you the key points that I want people to take away from this slide. And those people for whom this is relevant can sort of take a look at the model and ask me questions about it later. But the basic idea here is I'm looking at this, uh, this term right here. What is social capital doing when I multiply it with the temperature term? And how does that influence the level of conflict? And what I'm gonna learn is that if it's the case that when social capital is high, temperature leads to less conflict, or rather it dampens down the degree to which temperature causes conflict. And that's gonna support my first hypothesis, hypothesis one. And in the math, that's gonna come out where this beta two term is negative. The negative means that as social capital is higher, there's less of a degree to which temperature causes conflict. In contrast, if my opposing hypothesis is true, the one that says that social capital makes things worse, then that's gonna show a positive value greater than zero for beta two. So if beta two is negative, that means social capital is kind of helping in some sense. High temperature years are less likely to cause conflict. If, social, if beta two is positive, that means that social capital is hurting. High temperature years are more likely to cause conflict. And what do we find? Well, the row that indicates the beta two term is this middle one right here. And we see consistently negative results for each type of social capital in various uh, ways of measuring the data. So this indicates very clearly and consistently that, there's a degree, that uh, when social capital is higher, the degree to which temperature causes conflict is lower. This is another sort of graphical representation that may be a better for someone like me who's a visual learner. As you kind of move, um, or I think I'm a visual learner. Anyway, sorry. As you kind of move from left to right across this spectrum, from low to high levels of social capital, this vertical axis tells us how much does temperature relate to conflict? To what degree is temperature uh, driving conflict? And what we see is it decreases, decreases, decreases as you go across the spectrum from left to right. So as we move from low to high social capital, 
the degree to which temperature causes conflict is lower. In places with low social capital, not a lot of trust, high temperature years have a lot more conflict. In places where social capital is high, high temperature years have a lot less conflict. And so there's sort of a general downward relationship here that we capture in my, in my models. So what have we learned from the data analysis from this first chapter? Well, I'm gonna sort of pose this as what do we know so far and what do we still want to know? What we know is that social capital is strongly and robustly, meaning sort of consistently in many different versions of the analysis, associated with lower or more negative effects of temperature on conflict. Places where social capital is low have a more positive marginal effect of temperature on conflict. Places where social capital is high have a more negative effect of temperature on conflict. This supports my first hypothesis, H1 and not H2. And I think this is already a substantial finding for the literature. Um, what we do not yet know is, is actually social capital doing the work, we say. Is that the reason why there's a difference between the effect of temperature on conflict? Or could it just be proxying for some other factor? There's something else going on that's correlated with social capital, it's related to the level of social capital, but actually it's this other thing that matters. It's the regime type. It's the level of ethnic fractionalization, like the number, the diversity, the sort of ethnic diversity in the area. There could be something else that's causing this difference. And so we want to know about that. Um, and this is important because we want to know if we were to try to change the level of social capital in this place, if we sent in um, organizers and, and the government actors and international aid agencies to try and increase people's trust, if that can be done in whatever way possible, we want to know is that going to actually have a benefit like we're seeing in these data, or is it just going to be irrelevant because it's actually representing some other factor, not social capital that matters. So I'm going to check on this with a variety of analyses that I won't show you the results of here, but happy to answer Q and A's about. I include a whole bunch of other factors that could be the explanation. Is it that social capital is just telling us about how many people there are, the distance to borders, the political or social situation? Otherwise, is it talking? Is it related to economic development? And it's actually about the economic development level, not the social capital level, that explains this relationship. I run all these factors and I find little evidence that it's that social capital is being actually proxying for other stuff. I find little evidence that the main result that social capital has a negative influence of the degree to which temperature causes conflict, that that's wrong. It's very consistent. It holds up really well to all these tests. I add additional controls, which are called fixed effects. I say, OK, if we're just comparing places within the same region across Africa, does it even hold true within the same region? If I'm only comparing places within the same country, does this hold true with only within the same country? And I find that these actually do reduce the size of the effect of social capital, but the social capital effect is still there. It's still substantial and it's still significant in a statistical sense. And so what this means is that I can throw a lot of critiques at this model. I can throw a lot of changes and try out different things. And I still am getting the same result, which is that high social capital makes a big difference for the degree to which temperature causes conflict. And then I also check on reverse causality. Could it be the case that uh, the level of conflict is causing the level of social capital to change? And if so, is that affecting my results? And I don't find a lot of evidence of that. Like, again, I can get into details on this later on. So these are some of my takeaways. We went over a few of these here. Um, we, we know that the moderating role of social capital is not explained by other major factors, but there's still future work that needs to be done to improve this study or to do subsequent studies to build upon it, um, such as to understand what is social capital actually doing. I told you a bunch of different ways in which it could matter, but I didn't say for sure it's this reason or it's that reason. And so if we take a finer grain look at the types of social capital and the context in which it's operating, um, possibly through case study types of studies to explore sort of what are actually people doing in the conditions when they face a drought, uh, that could tell us more about what might be going on here. Um, and we might want to test this in other contexts. It's only in Africa, across a broad swath of, of the countries in Africa, but there could be other places where things are different. Okay, let's move into the second study, which actually helps us to kind of get a little leverage on some of those questions that are outstanding from the first one. This is uh, called Climate and Cooperation Evidence from Namibia, and it's with a, a political science PhD student at Columbia named Dylan Groves. And this study is gonna focus more on a mechanism that we're curious about. And that is, okay, we have a drought. The drought might lead to livelihood losses. It might lead to people sort of struggling a lot more to kind of get by. And that might lead to sort of social breakdown or enemy. It might lead sort of normal trusting relationships, norming, normal cooperative relationships to kind of break down and lead to sort of more conflict as a result. And that could increase the degree to which conflict arises when there's a drought. There's an alternative direction though. Maybe the drought leads people to come together and respond as kind of a resilient uh, community. And they say, hey, we have this common adversary, this, this drought not a personal adversary, but sort of, you know, like a challenge that we're going to overcome. And they come together and they sort of build community around um, recovering from this drought or managing through it together. That leads people to work together to overcome challenges. And that actually leads to a lower level of conflict, at least in the context of these communities. 
So what's going on here, we're, we're curious about the people who are involved in this study are, um, are herd, cat, like cattle herd managers in Northern Namibia, in these sort of Northern, northern communal areas in the Northern part of Namibia, which is in uh, Western Southern Africa. Um, and what I'm showing here is sort of the, the rainfall levels in the rainy seasons uh, in, in different regions of the country. And what we see here is like so the normal rainfalls of this green line. And then in the years 2013, 2014, uh, 2015, and with some recovery in 2017, the, there's a big drought and it starts to sort of recover over time. That varies a bit from region to region and that gives us some of the variation we can use to learn about this question. And what we're curious is when there's more drought, when the drought is more severe, does that affect people's behavior? Do they come together? Or do they kind of split apart? Do they cooperate more or are they more sort of averse to helping out their neighbors and friends? And these lines show sort of where data collection happens. So there was a survey in 2014 here, one in 2016 here, one of the comparisons is between these two, sorry. And then there's another set of uh, what are referred to as behavioral games. So how much, uh, asking people, how much do you want to contribute to a common pool of resources among your neighbors and friends? And that question was asked uh, both in 2016 and 2017. And so we look at the sort of differences between the different regions and different locations and the differences in the degree to which the drought is occurring to teach us about how people respond to the level of drought. The big takeaway on the questions from the public goods game, which let me describe a little bit more, is so you're given a bunch of money or sort of coin, sort of tokens that represent money, real money. And you're told, okay, you have a choice. You can give a certain number of these tokens to a common pool of tokens, a common pot, or you can keep them for yourself. If you keep them for yourself, you're guaranteed to get whatever money you kept for yourself. But if you give money and the other people in your group also give money, then you can increase, you can sort of double your money. You can increase the degree to which you get money. So the way this works is that if you are trusting of other people, if they're trusting of you, if people tend to be pro-social and support each other, they give more money and then everyone benefits. But if they tend to be more sort of individualistic and don't trust other people uh, with their money, then it's actually harmful to give more money because the other person's not gonna give money and you're gonna lose out. So there's this sense of sort of how much do we sort of cooperate with each other? How much do we care about each other's um, well-being? Uh, and these things uh, are tested in this game. And what we find here is that there's overall kind of a negative relationship. It's, it's marginally statistically significant in the case of giving money and it's less so, but the point estimates are sort of like, if, if it's anything, it seems to be negative, although there isn't statistical support for that result. Uh, that we also expect people to have this negative relationship. The negative relationship means when the rainfall is greater, we give less and we expect less from others. And when the rainfall is lower, we give more and we expect more from others. And what does this mean? This is a kind of, in my interpretation, a resilience response. So people, when they're faced with a challenging circumstance are actually kind of bouncing back to saying, oh, when I'm challenged, when I'm facing this hardship, I'm gonna actually give more and support my neighbors more. I'm not gonna break off and do my own thing. I'm gonna sort of come together with a group and try to solve these problems where I'm gonna to try to sort of like be more helpful in those cases. So that's the, the main result we get out of this part of the paper. We kind of check that against some other results which are less consistent, let's say, um, that have to do with people's actual behavior. So not their behavior in games, but their behavior sort of, do they participate in committees that organize how people will graze their common grazing land? Or do they participate or give contributions to the committee that organizes their sort of water point or water resource access? And these bounce around a little bit, but in, some, in three of the four sort of main models, we tend to see this negative combination result, um, which generally supports the initial result of this kind of negative relationship between temperature and pro-sociality or sort of common, common, um, common sort of joining together with others to, to kind of benefit the group. Um, in three of the four models, we see a negative uh, point estimate here, which if anything supports the idea that when the drought is worse, people are sort of responding positively. It might, the indication sort of from a statistical significant standpoint is that maybe there isn't much of a response, which would also kind of be okay. At the very least, we're not seeing evidence that it's getting worse uh, when the drought is in session, except for this one model that's a bit of an outlier here. So overall, our, our sort of general takeaways are that either there's no influence of drought on this pro-sociality or in a more rosy picture interpreting the results, there's actually a positive influence. People have this kind of built-in resilience mechanism where when the, when the going gets tough, they respond collectively. Okay, I'm going to very briefly talk about study three, for which the results are very preliminary and the, the model results are quite different across different models. But I'll tell you what's going on here. This one's about how social safety nets, can they prevent climate related conflicts and the evidence is from Ethiopia. And those maps I showed you, those, those are the data that I'm using to sort of explore this question. This is joint work with Marshall, who is, you just heard from. Um, this is asking in particular about the mechanism that I described as the, um, 
opportunity cost mechanism, which is that there might be some drought or high temperature that affects people's crops or their ability to uh, maintain their cattle herds. This leads to losses of livelihoods. This leads to uh, increased competition over resources or increased incentive, relatively speaking, to join rebel or criminal organizations. And either of these intermediary factors could lead to an increase in conflict. And the notion, oh, sorry, and then, and then we want to know, okay, what could we do about it? So one thing we could potentially do about it, and there's evidence, especially from India, that indicates that this could make a big difference, is we can have a social safety net. We can put people who are poor or food insecure to work. We can give them funds, even when the climate system is kind of not agreeing with them and not producing a lot of crops. And if we come in and we give them these funds or we put them to work, then these other mechanisms that are depending on people not having work and then depending on people not having a good income should be lessened, should be blocked. And so what's happening here is if it's high temperature and drought, we're curious about this moderator of the social safety net program known as the PSNP in Ethiopia. This is some data from the PSNP as it's kind of spread across the country over time. You see it was sort of like in a select set of areas here, but over time it kind of got bigger and spread out more across the country. And that variation over time from no PSNP to yes PSNP and also from uh, like at all to, to yes for some place. And the change in the places that receive this, this benefit uh, helps us to, to measure and get some results. We also know that the level of conflict has changed over time across the country. And we run some models to explore the relationships between these things. And the results at this stage in the process of this, of this project are quite variable. Different models with different measures of temperature and precipitation and different measures of conflict tell us some varying things. So a kind of generic model that includes all types of violent outcomes so like for any type of violence, does the PSNP matter? We see that maybe there's some evidence that it, that it does matter a little bit and making it less likely that there's violence uh, when the temperature is kind of stressful. But when we break it down by individual types of violence, um, there's some evidence that actually it doesn't make a huge difference. That, so when there's a drought or when there's low precipitation, we see higher levels of protests and riots. And it doesn't appear that at least in those models, the PSNP does much at all to prevent that from happening. So, the jury's still out a little bit on this. We're gonna to continue to revise and improve uh, these results as, as this project goes on, and we'll learn more at that stage. Okay, so we're rounding out our time here. I'm gonna to try to wrap up a bit. The next question is, why does this matter for communities and policymakers? So there's a number of policy implications from my first study. I think the main idea is that social capital matters a lot. It's kind of the biggest takeaway that I have. And so we wanna target any kind of interventions during high temperature years when the climate we assume is more stressful. Uh, to these low social capital areas. Places with low trust, places with low community organization and engagement are more vulnerable, it appears, to high temperature in terms of the level of conflict that occurs. So we wanna to try to support those places. If, if, there, if we predict that the temperature is gonna be high due to sort of El, the El Nino, La Nina cycle, for example, we've gotta really be ready to step in to help out those places to prevent conflict from occurring. And we might wanna help out by actually working to increase trust and increase social cap capital over time in these places but also that can be pretty hard to do. Trust is a very long standing and historically consistent factor in communities and it may be tough to do. So if we can't actually improve trust or social capital, we can try to intervene in other ways to sort of compensate for the low level of social capital in these places. Zooming out a little bit and talking sort of more broadly about the dissertation, uh, I think what this tells us in my dissertation in general, where basically the main studies were all focused on kind of social factors until the third chapter at least, I'm seeing that these social factors are quite important to climate resilience, and I'm not the only one seeing this. But I think in terms of including uh, the outcomes like conflict events, uh, whether you trust your neighbors, whether you engage in kind of communal activity can play a big role in the degree to which you're resilient to these climatic shocks. I've also learned that large scale quantitative analyses can teach us important effects, sort of overall relationships, but that they should be compensated or complemented, excuse, excuse me, by smaller scale, more in-depth qualitative research that can tell us about, okay, what's actually going on in these places that have high social capital? What's actually going on during a drought in these places that have low social capital? I don't answer that well with my style of analysis. So it's helpful to sort of work with other people who are doing more in-depth research in specific contexts to learn more about that. And the last thing is that interventions, if they're trying to improve social capital, if they're trying to improve economic standing, should be done carefully. Interventions that are that are focused on uh, that are focused on climate uh, resilience should be conflict sensitive, should be concerned about how that climate resilience intervention is going to impact uh, the likelihood of conflict. And Conflict-focused interventions, things that are supposed to help build resilience against conflict should be climate sensitive. It could be the case that the things we do to improve response to the conflict actually harm climate resilience. And because these things are so interrelated with each other, uh, trying to intervene on one factor and leaving out the other one can lead to a less than positive outcome overall. Okay, so what do we still wanna learn? 
quick touch on some future agenda. So in future developments of these projects or in future studies that build on these, uh, these projects moving forward, we want to kind of refine the data and approaches to better tease out causal mechanisms. So again, why is it that social capital seems to matter a lot? We can get a better idea of that by focusing on individual types of social capital, individual types of conflict, trying to understand the individual context in which these relationships are operating to learn more. Um, and then sort of my future agenda in general, uh, I'm eager to sort of try to build a broader data set that looks at how governments uh, across the world, potentially starting with governments in Africa, respond and how international actors respond to climate shocks and stressors in a kind of comprehensive way to learn about whether these responses vary by location, whether they, they vary by kind, kinds of climate shocks. And then another sort of direction that I'd like to explore is to move from Africa more into the countries of Latin America where the kind of violence is different. It's often carried out by criminal organizations. Um, and that leads to sort of a different set of dynamics to consider. Uh, or we want to we want to learn whether it involves a different set of dynamics to consider than the kinds of civil conflict that we tend to see more commonly or communal conflict we tend to see more commonly in Africa. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a picture of, of my kids uh, from this past Father's Day, and we look forward to your questions and future developments. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. That was a, a terrific talk. Um, very important topic. We will now invite members of the audience uh, to participate in the Q&A, as I mentioned in the beginning. So those who are attending virtually on Zoom uh, may ask your questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not chat, but the Q&A box. And I'll read your questions out loud to the audience. Those in attending in person uh, may just raise your hand and do it in, in the conventional way. I'll give Garrett a few minutes at the end to have a final say. Okay, uh, let me let me just ask, take my prerogative to ask you a question, Garrett, before uh, Robbie collect the questions. So your 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 regression where you use the uh, average annual 12 month temperature as the uh, as the measure of climate, um, what was Gave you surprisingly powerful results. I'm quite impressed. That 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 I think is really picking up the cross-sectional differences in your in your sample. Uh, it, but if if one looks at uh, uh, a more sensitive measure of temperature, such as the agriculture people do with uh, killing degree days, looking at temperatures over 90 degrees, might you get uh, stronger results even? Uh, particularly looking at how they vary at the same spot from year to year. Yeah, I mean, I think basically the answer is yes. So I'm using kind of blunt uh, measures of climate, both on the kind of uh, temperature and precipitation side. Th those have some advantages for sort of teaching us broad scale relationships, right? If I want to know, you know, if I know that like across the world, we're going to see increases in temperature, I want to make a sort of general statement about how high temperatures are likely to influence conflict and what factors may matter. Then, um, then that can be a useful measure. But if I want to learn specifically about the mechanisms going through agricultural productivity, then yes, killing degree days could be more valuable. The one thing that I'll sort of note, though, is that there's evidence in the literature broadly that agricultural factors are only one of the factors. And as I sort of set up my set of mechanisms, it is probably a major factor in many places, but there can also be these direct effects on people's emotions and uh, physiology that don't go through agricultural pathways. And so the killing degree days may not be the most precise way of measuring that impact. And so we might choose a different, say, temperature measure to focus on those. Things. But yeah, I agree that, that having more refined uh, climate uh, data types uh, can help us to tease out the specific pathways better in which these uh, mechanisms are operating. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking of it going through agriculture so much as these images of a hot, steamy day in New York City in August when it's up in over 100 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, and everything's on. Everybody's on tender hooks. Yes, yes. that sort of effect. Yeah, yeah. No, there could be there could be human uh, killing degree days too. You know, not killing, but human aggravation degree days. Or something That's like exactly. Once you hit a certain threshold, sure. Yeah. So we we do have a question here on uh, on the Q and A. So let me this this is from Ming Hao Chi. Uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, sorry if I'm not. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Garrett. I was wondering if you think the ability to accurately predict forecasts of climate extremes and issuance of early warnings to local communities 
would be helpful to prevent negative outcomes like conflict? Or is this something local people are quite aware of and the solution requires support from outside or effort to help directly increase the resilience of the community? Yeah, so my, my sense of the answer to the first question is just yes. Uh, having this kind of predictive information is gonna help us because um, it can help people to make better decisions about their crops or their, or their, um, or their, um, their animals or other sorts of economic factors that depend on temperature and other climatic factors to drive their livelihoods. They, they can plan, they can, they can try to create resilience ahead of time in, in preparation. Um, now, many of these places just don't have the capacity to do much to respond, but within their own spheres, they can do more. And so I think it's sort of a yes and. So yes, individual communities, when they know to, to they're facing a potential threat, uh, can be better protected if they if they can plan ahead. And they can also gain better access to outside resources. They can, one of the ways they can plan ahead is by just rallying together as a as community to try to advocate for extra support. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think I mean, the predictive uh, element of this is, is a quite important. Um, I think this uh, next question also talks about predictiveness. Sorry, Charlie, do you want to? Oh, you mean the one on the Q and A? Let yeah, me, okay. I have to. I'll, I'll say it. Is there a live audience where you are? They have. No, there's no live audience, so I can. Just okay, speak. so it's all in the Q and A. <clears throat> so this is from Kate Brownman. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Are there ways this might be used predictively? Uh, that it, it is a very similar uh, question, given that you're looking at marginal effects. Can this help us pinpoint where violence might break out? Uh, yeah, again, I, I think it can help us to anticipate that. Uh, I think it's sort of telling us that, so, so for example, like, um, so my, my study is not geared specifically towards just asking the question in general, does social capital prevent conflict? Um, that's a different question than what I'm trying to analyze. My data sort of supports a, an answer of yes to that question. But mine is specifically asking about this sort of climate uh, variability in response to climate. So, so I think I can reasonably confidently say based on this data, these data that when hot years are coming, when they we're experiencing a hot year, uh, places that have low social capital are more vulnerable. And so, yeah, we can, we can sort of predict that those are gonna be the more dangerous spots and we should orient our focus. If you have limited resources, we should put our focus towards places that have low social capital rather than high social capital in terms of protecting them against these sorts of conflict events. Okay, uh, calling any other questions? We're almost out of time anyway, but it, we probably have, could squeeze in one more question. But if there's, there is, there are no, no questions further, I will uh, give the final word um, to Garrett. Um, so take it away, Garrett. Uh, lots of acknowledgments to give in support of getting to this point in my dissertation. Uh, first off, uh, this is a no order or rank of any kind. I'm just gonna mention a variety of different people. So the first off, I've got to, I've got to mention my committee. Uh, Marshall and Ken have been with me like from day one, from before I came to Stanford. Uh, they started as my lead advisors, you know, in my first year and they continued all the way through and they've been a great source of support all throughout the many years that I've been here now, which is nearly six years. Um, Catherine also, and Jeremy also from very early on, I think I met them both in, you know, mainly in my second year, I took a course with Jeremy and I, I interacted a bunch with Catherine. And then Catherine has continued uh, to include me in her lab group over in Miami virtually, which has been awesome. And then thank you so much, Charlie, to managing this whole uh, complicated dissertation process and to being a great professor of mine um, back when I was taking courses and also to being the chair of my qualifying defense. So Charlie's been through this process with me for a while now also. My pleasure. I probably uh, am missing some people from this EIPER uh, support staff list, but some people who uh, have helped me throughout the years are Sue and Anne-Marie and Jen Mason and Gabby and I and Anjana and Maylee. And like someone's gonna be like, what about me? And I'm sorry about that person. And I wanna sort of specifically highlight uh, uh, Sue and Anne-Marie who are kind of around like early on in my time here. And Anne-Marie is like really, really dealt with me like all the way, basically all the way through and all of my issues and all of my challenges and whatever, whatever, I especially uh, appreciate that support. And more recently, she's handed over that job of dealing with the frustrating aspects of, of managing uh, my participation in the program to I, and so I really appreciate I support as well. Um, thank you to my friends and cohort mates in EIPER, as well as uh, people I took a lot of courses with in the Stanford Political Science PhD department, and the kind of like other little home I found in New York when I moved to New York in the Columbia P uh, Political Science PhD department uh, program. Um, a huge contribution to my research. This research would be like nowhere near where it is without my engagement in various lab and sort of dissertation support groups. In particular, Marshall's Echo Lab group 
the Environmental Change and Human, Human Outcomes Group, which I've been with you know, since uh, year two in the program. And like, man, uh, so much of this work and so many of the good robustness checks and tests and improvements on my maps and improvements on my analysis, like just like on and on and on has come from people in that group. And I wanna name all those people, but there's too many to name and I can uh, give you my direct thanks individually when I see you. Thank you so much for all of your support. Uh, the climate prep group in Miami uh, under Catherine has been amazing. It's been so wonderful to be welcomed in yet another group. And then um, I had this nice little group going of folks in the EIPER cohort above mine, actually, consistently over multiple years, uh, kind of giving each other feedback and that kind of thing, what we called the work in progress group or something like that. My funding came from the Davis Family EIPER Fellowship, primarily in the Stanford King Center on Global Development. Um, there may have been others, and I apologize for leaving them out. I'll, I'll add them to my acknowledgments of the dissertation if I missed anyone. And then most importantly, um, my partner and now two kids, my parents and brothers, and other uh, family, siblings-in-law, and friends who have sort of given me the emotional support and resilience and, and kept me going through all this, uh, all these challenging times and helped us survive the pandemic. In particular, I have to thank my wife for a huge amount of support and work and management of my life and my kids' lives and, and our sort of collective well-being. And so I will end on this little note, uh, thanking everyone else and, and uh, thanking showing off my children because they're, they're wonderful uh, and appreciating them for all of the joys they bring me in my life um, and my wife for all the joy that she brings me as well. Um, so thank you very much to everyone involved in this process. Well, thank you, Gary, that's very inspiring. And uh, applause won't be deafening in this thing, but uh, we'll just um, um, So thank you very much. Um, we will now adjourn this presentation and uh, the committee will um, we'll take a 15 minute break. So unless there's an objection, we'll come back together at uh, 10, 15 in the private session. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.